and encourage you to open your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 14. Chapter 2 and verse 14. We have three verses to cover this morning, 14, 15, and 16, as we continue our journey through this book about the centrality of Christ to all of life. As you turn there, I'd like to remind all of us that we are about to read God's very voice. This is truth. It is accuracy. It is reality. It defines our calling, our identity, our purpose. And as the psalmist says, it is more than much fine gold. Let's begin reading the voice of our Lord. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world." holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Well, over the last number of weeks, six weeks or so, I've enjoyed catching some of the games of the NBA playoffs. I enjoy watching basketball. I don't watch it for most of the year, but I enjoy watching some of the playoff uh, games. And there is one aspect, at least one, that I do not enjoy, and that is the constant grumbling and complaining of the athletes against their fellow players on the court and against the officials. Uh, It is remarkable. It really is irrelevant uh, whether there was a foul or not, uh, whether it had anything to do with accuracy or not. Uh, Grumbling, especially for some players, uh, just is a habit. It's a way of life. They they grumble whenever they hear a whistle. Uh, They grumble when they don't hear a whistle. They grumble all the time. They grumble dramatically. They grumble plaintively. They grumble desperately and angrily and furiously and profanely. They grumble all the time, and they dispute Everything, everything is a matter of dispute. The very line on the court, which is literally a line, is a matter of dispute to some professional athletes. And this is true not just in basketball, but in other sports as well. It is remarkable to watch replays of professional soccer events, noting that no one touched the individual, and yet they fell as if almost dead. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable thing to watch the replay and see the agony, knowing from the replay, nothing touched you, and yet you seem to be in excruciating pain. Uh, this is a way of life for many in the professional sporting community, and yet, honestly, it is also a way of life for me. I don't like how dramatic they are, how it interrupts the game. I actually am am delightfully surprised when someone does not argue. If you've ever seen in a, in a basketball game, I don't know if it happens in other kinds of sporting events, when, when someone commits a foul and they acknowledge that foul, they raise their hand or they simply lower their head and just walk back up the court, no argument stands out. It's almost shocking and surprising to find someone who doesn't argue, who doesn't dispute. It, it stands out. It's unique. It's delightful, frankly. It's delightful to see someone who doesn't like to argue, who doesn't want to argue, and yet often I know 
That is not how I am. In reading this passage this week, uh, as I'm sure you could imagine, I was just immediately experiencing conviction. Of all the ways this week that I have been complaining, all the ways this week that my spirit has been argumentative, quick to defend myself and put others down, quick to question the goodness of God in some circumstance of my life. I was reliving conversations. And yeah, at what point did that go from honestly sharing a burden that I'm having and move into complaining sinfully in an arrogant way? Quite frequently, I crossed over that line, and I was struck by the absolute categorical nature of this passage as it relates to me. Do nothing, John, with grumbling or disputing. This passage, it flows out of what Paul has been saying, going all the way back uh, to chapter 1, verse 27, that we are called to live worthy of the gospel And then what he immediately said in the preceding passage, that we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We're to exercise the reality of who we are in Christ. And the first practical application that comes to Paul's mind in working out our identity in Christ is to stop grumbling and make sure there is no disputing. Now, we don't know because he doesn't say precisely whether this was a widespread problem in the church, whether this was more of a warning uh, to the church to guard them. We know that at least there were two ladies that are referenced in chapter 4 who were having some kind of a dispute that Paul urges and charges them to reconcile. We also know that there, there's points in this letter where he references their leaders in somewhat of a pronounced way. So we don't know if perhaps they were grumbling or they were tempted to grumble and dispute against their leaders in the church. Uh, certainly, uh, Paul is overwhelmingly focused on gratefulness throughout his letters. So this may have just been a general uh, warning for the church. Do not be this way. There is no place, Paul would say, for grumbling and arguing among the people of God. There is no place for it. There is no place for grumbling and arguing among those called to Christ. No place whatsoever. Do not, he would say. Not different than what we would say to our children. No, no, this this is a may not. This is a you may not do this. You may not grumble and complain. You may not argue, Paul would say, as a pastoral father to this flock. Do nothing. There is no place for grumbling or complaining or arguing among the people of God who are called to godliness, called to a peaceful godliness, a contented, grateful godliness that displays their calling in Christ Jesus. I want to make four points about this passage. They're really just walking through the different phrases that Paul uses one at a time. The first is a peaceful command. A peaceful command. This is this imperative, this charge in verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. This is the command. It it functions as a head of all this following passage. Do all things. You notice the comprehensive language. Anything you do is to be without grumbling or disputing. These words, grumbling and disputing, one seems to call to mind complaining, being frustrated or angry about some desire that is not being met or some right that's not being acknowledged, and referencing that in a selfish or sinful way. That's complaining. Disputing seems to reference arguing trying to get your way, looking to pick a fight because you have some desire, whether to put someone else down or simply to convince them that you are right and they are wrong. This is not to be present in the people of God. Now, a couple of caveats important to reference here. This this is not stating that all conversations of disagreement are arguing or disputing. This is not talking about having a healthy, servant-hearted, godly conversation of trying to understand one another or even trying to persuade someone else. This is speaking to that kind of arguing that is motivated by a desire to control and get your way and put another person down. It flows out of chapter 2, which talks about considering others more significant than yourselves. 
that there is a way of discussing or even debating that honors and respects the other person's opinion is not looking just to put them down or to push yourself up, but honestly to, to reach a point of mutual understanding and benefit. There's a way even of sharing a burden that you have or correcting even others because of their sin against you that is not complaining. And then there is that thing that we all know that we do where we're just sinfully expressing our frustration and anger that the other person does not count us as significant as we count ourselves. Now, Paul doesn't state here whether this complaining and disputing is primarily directed to the Lord or is it directed to people. The words actually bring to mind God's description of the Israelites when they wandered through the wilderness and they were grumbling against the Lord and against Moses. But because so much of this letter focuses on their relationship with each other, I think it's probably the case that primarily he has in view their relational complaining, complaining about others and disputing with others. But I, I think it also references that that complaining in the, in the ultimate case is directed to the Lord. When we complain about somebody else, we're really complaining about the fact that God has put this person in our life. When we're arguing with someone else, we're really trying to get our way rather than trusting God. So whether it's directed towards people or towards God directly or towards people as a subtle way of complaining to God, in any case, any kind of complaining and arguing has no place among the people of God. Do nothing, Paul says. Nothing. That means not bedtime with the kids. That means not waking up more abruptly and early than you were planning on because of some household member. That means not going through traffic. That means not carrying the extra load on a ministry team because somebody didn't show up. That means not cleaning up after someone else in your household. That means not laboring to provide for people who don't appreciate it. That, that means nothing. That means not hosting messy people. That means not talking with talkative people. That means nothing. Do nothing with grumbling or disputing. Sometimes disputing is born out of a, an enjoyment of demonstrating your rhetorical ability. Have you ever had that experience where you, you have a conversation with somebody and later on you think, Oh, why didn't I say that? That would have been the crushing blow. Why do I think of brilliant things late? What is wrong with me? Have you ever had that thought? You know that same motive was in your heart in the conversation? You or I, we just weren't smart enough to come up with it. But the motive was there. If we could have thought of it, we would have enjoyed bashing them over the head with that particular nugget of condescending brilliance. We would have loved the ability to do that. If only we could have come up with it. The, the motive was there. I will crush you. I will point out the holes in your ridiculous argument of why it's my fault that this room looks this way. I, I will crush you. I will crush your argument of who works harder. I will crush your argument of who's forgiven more. I will crush your argument of who's nicer and sweeter and more forgiving. I, I, I will crush you. What is that but disputing, arguing? Have you ever had the conversation uh, with someone and, and you find that they just enjoy disagreeing with things just for the sake of disagreeing? Have you ever found that exasperating? Oh, I, I think it was going to be a nice day tomorrow. Probably won't be. Even things that you know they agree with you, but for some reason they're not at peace unless a contrary opinion has been expressed. I thought that cake was excellent. I thought it could have been better. I think things are going well. Are they really, though? And sometimes you wonder, do you enjoy disputing? And then you realize, I do the same. 
when I'm really annoyed by someone who happens to be bubbling through their day with some giddy perspective, and I feel the need to point out that not everything's happy right now, okay? <laughs> let's put a little dose of realism in your bubbly Winnie the Pooh bubble right now. Let's, let's, let's dose this with reality. We want to be realistic. Arguing, disputing, finding joy in finding fault or finding fallacies. Disputing. Finding joy in finding fault or finding fallacies. What is that? Not a heart that counts others more significant than yourselves. Do all things. That's the command. It's a peaceful command. What I mean by that is it's a call to peace. It's a call to peace. It's a call to love peace. It, it doesn't mean we don't helpfully exhort or correct or have friendly conversations discussing the merits of an issue, but we all know in our heart of hearts when we cross that line into sinful complaining and sinful disputing in which we are not serving the other person but rather ourselves. Do nothing. That's the peaceful command. The church of God is called to peace. It's called to pursue peace as much as it depends on you. It's called to do nothing with sinful complaining, with sinful disputing. We are not to find fault or found fallacies in every occasion that we can. We are to do nothing. And it has a goal. That's point number two. A godly goal. A godly goal, a peaceful command, and a godly goal. The goal of this focuses on this word, that. Look down at your Bibles. Notice the command. Paul often does this. He gives this overarching command, and then he'll give a goal. And when you see that word, that, in the New Testament, that's very important. It gives a sense of motive or result that Paul is looking for. It's an aim. It's an aim that he's pointing them towards. It's not just a command. It has a purpose clause attached to it. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that, you see that in your Bibles, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. This is the that clause of this paragraph, that you may be. He uses these phrases blameless and innocent. Those words do not mean sinless. And if you've ever wondered, actually, if you read your Old Testament and David, for example, when he writes, uh, you know, I am blameless before you, that, that word does not mean sinless. It doesn't mean uh, without sin. It means that his way of life is righteous before God. His pattern of life is a pattern following God, following the law of God, following the requirements of God. It doesn't mean sinless. It doesn't mean he's perfect in his heart in every occasion, that he never fails. It means that he is following the way of the Lord. Blameless and innocent. Not perfect. This is not speaking of our justification, our imputed righteousness, where in Christ our record in heaven is perfectly righteous, sinless before God. This is talking about our actual lived out righteousness, where it is possible for a Christian to be blameless in the sense that they are without a way of life that is blameworthy in some substantial way. They are not rejecting God. And for the purpose of this passage, the particular way in which they are blameless is not grumbling or disputing. They are blameless and innocent. And here's a very important phrase, children of God without blemish. The phrase children of God here, it is, it is not referring to that identity that we are given so much as it is the character that we exhibit from that identity. Here's what I mean. To be a child uh, in the ancient days was not just to be uh, someone who came from a, a certain parentage. It, it also had to do with someone who reflects that parentage. To be a child of God, it was not merely to say, you have the status, this is your genetic parentage. No, it's to say, you look like your father, you are following, you are, boy, you are his child. We often use that phrase when we're talking about physical attributes. The Bible writers use that phrase when they're talking about character attributes. 
We would say, boy, you're, you're sure his son. You're sure her daughter. Yes, you are. The Bible says that's the way it should be with our character. We should be children of God. We should reflect God. We should be like God. We should look like who God is. And therefore, we should not be complaining or disputing. We should be blameless. We should be holy, as we're called to be, as he is holy. No question here of perfection. This is not sinlessness. This is just a calling that our righteousness is meant to make us look like our God. The calling of the Christian is to accurately reflect their father to bear the family resemblance in their character, we could say, to be humble in the way Jesus is humble, to be loving in the way the Father is loving, to be peaceful in the way the Prince of Peace is peaceful. We are to look like our Father. We are to be children of God without blemish. The, the phrases here give us certain sobriety, I think, to the categories of grumbling and complaining. To God complaining is a spiritual blemish. It is not a, to use Jerry Bridges' phrase, a respectable sin. It is a blemish. It is blameworthy to complain. It is blemishing to dispute. This is to fall short of our calling. This is not merely a, a, a character trait or a, a personality trait or a family background or a, a, a kind of disposition. This is to fall short of our purpose. Look, look at the logic of the passage. Do all things. Now remember, th these are the moments we have to come to grips with. This is God's word. God is commanding us here to think this way. What is God saying? Don't grumble or dispute by not grumbling and disputing, the goal is that you would be blameless and innocent children of God. You look like God without blemish. So rejecting grumbling and disputing is one of the ways that we fulfill our calling to be godly. He also gives the context of this godliness, this godly goal. He says you're you are this way in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. He's saying, look, look, all around you, there is a twisted crookedness. There is a, a darkness and evilness in humanity. It surrounds us. All around you, we're surrounded by people who are not blameless, who are blemished by sin. We're surrounded by this. He uses this other metaphor of, of, of the, the blackness of space, the, the darkness of space, and you see this, this bright star that stands out in that darkness. He's saying, look, your, your godliness, your blamelessness, your righteous way of life, it is going to stand out in a culture that is twisted and corrupted by sin. You see why it puts complaining and disputing in a very serious category. It's part of the twisting and the corrupting of sin and the darkness of this world that people are perpetually complaining and disputing in sinful ways. I can think of some of those professional sporting events. It stands out when a player does not argue. If, you ever, if you've ever watched soccer, which I rarely do, but sometimes I do, it is particularly notable. When someone gets bumped, hit, tripped, whatever, and they don't fall down, and they keep running, and they make no gesture towards the referee whatsoever. It, it's remarkable. You're like, wow, what just happened? It stands out. Because all the other times, even if they weren't bumped or weren't hit or weren't troubled in any way, they fall down and they're grimacing, grabbing their face and everything's terrible. And then there's that one place, he just keeps going as if it didn't happen. And it stands out. Well, that's what Paul's saying Christians are like in this world. This world is, is full of twisted and 
bent things. They're bent away from the glory of God. They're blemished by sin. They're, they're like an instrument that's been broken and twisted and can't accomplish its purpose anymore. They're, they're like a, a darkness that is surrounding us, filled with disputing and arguing and complaining. And, and there, there, Paul says, there is a Christian. He does not argue. He does not dispute. He does not complain. Oh, he, he is different. She is different. She stands out. She sits in the DMV without rolling her eyes. He sits in traffic without sighs of exasperation. He puts his children to bed without grumbling. There, there is a Christian. He obeys his parents' instruction without grumbling and whining. There is a Christian. He watches over his younger siblings without sighing and exasperation. Well, there, there, that stands out. When dinner is called and it's, oh gosh, it's spaghetti lasagna again. With lots of spinach. And yet, this one eats gratefully. There, there is a Christian. Stands out. There's one that looks like God. Look at this married couple when, when the one of them is exercising their desire for disputing. And the other is peaceful and calm and gives the gentle answer that turns away wrath. There, Paul would say, there's a star in the midst of a world filled with getting your own way. The implications of this star imagery, I think, is, is not only that you stand out, but that you benefit the blackness, the darkness as well. You benefit this darkness in a world full of crookedness there is at least one tool that is not bent. And isn't that the case? Christians are meant to be salt and light in the world. Their character doesn't just honor God, it also blesses others. So that in the business meeting, there is one at least who is willing to be reasonable. There is one at least who is peaceful and gracious in the midst of a dispute. There is one at least who is patient when the traffic is delayed, who is not honking. And that one blesses the others as well. Perhaps even gives an opportunity for witnessing to the reason why they are not that way. There is no place for grumbling or arguing among the people of God because they are meant to be distinct in this dark world. In this context of crooked and twisted people, twisted by sin, they shine as lights in the world. There is a godly goal. Thirdly, thirdly, there is a gospel grip. A gospel grip. Notice Paul describes what they are doing as they refuse to grumble and complain, as they stand out. What are they doing? They are holding fast to the word of life. What describes the Christian who is rejecting grumbling and disputing and standing out from the world, they are holding fast the word of life. They are not merely moralists determined to be a char characterized by superior morals. They are Christians characterized by a grip on the gospel of Jesus Christ. This phrase, the word of life, for Paul, certainly speaks to the word that brings life, which is the word of Christ. This is just another way of Paul saying, look, the, the gospel that you're to live worthy of must must be gripped on a daily basis, and that's what describes the person who is not grumbling or disputing. I think we could say it in reverse. The person who loses their grip on the gospel will quickly find their hands have picked up grumbling. 
A person who loses their grip on the gospel will quickly find that their hands have picked up grumbling. If you have found grumbling and disputing to be on the rise in your soul, it may be because you have not been holding fast to the word of life. I don't mean you're losing your salvation. I just mean functionally, experientially, you're not keeping in touch with that you were a sinner saved by grace, that Jesus, the Holy One, died in your place, that you were lost and now you're found, that you had no hope and now you have hope that you are headed to heaven that at your, on your worst most beleaguered most trafficy most annoying day you have more reason for joy than the richest most blessed individual who is not saved on this planet what are they doing these non grumbly people they're holding fast to the word of life they're, they're holding on to it. What does that mean? Let's just give some practical examples. It means that they're rehearsing in their mind that Jesus Christ died in my place, that I was without any dignity because of being a sinner who has rejected God. I had maligned myself, and yet God has raised me up, as the song says, so high above my station. He has adopted me as his child. He has reconciled me through Christ. He has given me a future and a hope, and I have all the reason in the world for gratefulness and joy. When that gift is in view. That word of life is held fast to. There is always a reason not to grumble. There's always a reason to not argue. Arguing implies defending yourself, taking for yourself in a selfish or arrogant way. But the person who is a Christian who's holding fast to the word of life is mostly aware that God has rescued me, that God is my refuge, that God protects my reputation, that God will ultimately bring about justice for me in the midst of an unfair situation. That person who's always being falsely accused, who's always being beleaguered by demands and, and disputed with by those around him, they can hold fast to the fact that Jesus has loved them and, and caused them to be reborn, and they have hope in him. They don't need to cling to their own protection. Arguing is a way of saying, no one better dare question me. But the cross says worse of us than any person ever could. And the cross says better of us than we ever could say for ourselves. The cross says worse of us than any person ever could. And the cross says better of us than we could ever say for ourselves. When we're holding fast to the word of life, we don't need to argue and dispute in sinful ways because we have all the security and joy and peace that we need. I'm not speaking to some kind of oblivious passivity that never has a rational conversation. I'm talking about removing that kind of sinful self-defensiveness, proving my way is right, the cross clinger is aware, mostly my way was wrong. And the way brought me life. This phrasing might also imply some connotation of, of not only holding fast the word of life, but, but also holding it in such a way that that is what you're concerned to share. The word that gives life, not only to you, but to others. Your concern is not to prove your point or to complain about their failure, but to be identified with the word of life that can give life to them and to you, especially in a moment of tension. Boy, there is a Christian who rather than looking to crush this individual, looks to give them the word of life. Isn't this a delightful passage? What's Paul doing? He's saying, there is no place for grumbling and disputing in the church 
because the church is called to godliness as a distinction from this dark world, and they do this as they hold fast to this word of the gospel, and that transforms them so that rather than being grumblers, they are grateful. Rather than being arguers, they are encouragers. Rather than being cynical, they are hopeful. Rather than being disputing, they are displaying the glory of the gospel that has transformed them from darkness to light and from arguers to encouragers. What a delightful command. Bible commands are always this way. They, they paint what you should be in delightful ways so that you would wonder, why would I not want to be that way? I don't want to be one of those people that just throws their arms up and stamps their foot and acts like a child every time it doesn't go my way. I want to be one of those people that is delightfully different contented in difficult circumstances, eager to be at peace, even in the most trying and contentious of moments. A gospel grip defines these people. A gospel grip. We need this gospel grip. And finally, a glorious result. Notice what Paul concludes with. They're holding fast to the word of life, and all of this, all of this, is so that in the day of Christ, Paul says to them, he reintroduces himself into the conversation, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul anticipates the future day of glory when the Christian way of life is brought before the great master in his return. And as a steward of the church, as one who's been called to, to raise up these churches and to shepherd them faithfully, he anticipates that day as a day of celebration. This isn't a, a point of, of kind of personal exaltation, but he does desire that his faithful stewardship would bear fruit, fruit that can be shown to the Lord of the harvest on that day. Paul sometimes pictures himself as a farmer. You might think of it that way. He's a farmer that doesn't own the land. He's a farmer that doesn't own the land, but he's working the soil, and he's watering, and he's pruning, and he's watching over it, and he's fighting off the, the bugs that come to eat the fruit, and he's, he's exhorting and urging and encouraging because one day the one who owns the land comes back. And Paul is saying here, I, I want in that day to be able to, the way a son would with his father, proudly say, look, look at the fruit of these trees you've given me. This isn't human arrogance. This is kind of filial affection and, and kind of stewardship where he goes and he says, look, look, look at the Philippian church. They're, they're not arguing. They're not disputing. They're blameless. They're like a, a star in an arguing world. He wants to be able to show that, and he wants that for them as well, that they would be able to show forth the fruit of the gospel in their life. He doesn't want to get there and think, all of my work was for nothing. Perhaps they make it to heaven, but they're barren trees, barren of the fruit of peacefulness, and filled with the thorns of grumbling and disputing. He envisions a, a kind of shame and embarrassment on the day when his church is presented to the king and the effort and work that he went to to labor and strive. And he uses an athletic analogy, running on behalf of this church. He says, it'd be like if, if I get there and what happens, the church just, it, it comes into the finish line bedraggled and broken. It, it, it brings its harvest and it's, it's nothing but, but shriveled fruit. Bitter fruit. Oh, that would be a shameful thing. He says, no, I, I, I want there to be a glorious result. I, I want your peacefulness, your gentleness, your openness to reason, your kindness instead of grumbling, your peacefulness instead of arguing. I, I want to be able to, to bring in that cart of fruit to the great master on that day. And as I, I bring it in, I want to be able to celebrate, yes, all of my labor for you, Lord Jesus was not worthless and in vain. Look at the Philippian church. And obviously none of us are Paul, but I, I think the pastors would, would want you to know we feel the same way. 
there is this mysterious, sober reality where somehow the leaders of a church will give account for their church on that day. And I want to be able to showcase the fruit of a non-grumbling, non-disputing church on that day. I want to be able to, to bring in one name after another of the membership of Redemption Hill and say, look, Lord, Lord, look, look what your grace did. The, the, the one who once was a disputer became an encourager. The one who once was always looking to prove their point became a listener. The one who, who was quick to complain became one who was overflowing with gratefulness. Look, look, Lord, look at this fruit. Look, all of the, the energy that you gave us to labor, it was not in vain. Look, look at the worthiness of this character in keeping with your gospel. And brothers and sisters, you should want that too. You should want that too. There is no place in the church for grumbling and arguing. And we are surrounded by a world that loves it. I'm sure there are many good things the Lord has used the internet to do, but one of the horrific things that Satan has used it to do is to make grumbling global. So now a grumble doesn't just affect the immediate audience or even people that could read a letter. Now it affects anybody worldwide. Look, Facebook is not a Bible-free zone. Philippians 2.14 commands Facebook posts and tweets and posts of any sort in the same way that it commands conversations. God sees no difference between your accountability and what you write and your accountability and what you say. Imagine if the holiness of God suddenly somehow showed up on various social media and all that was evaluated was this one verse, do nothing with grumbling and disputing that you may be innocent and blameless children of God shining as lights in the world. Just this one verse. Are we shining as lights in that grumbling world? Just one application. Evaluate your own social media use. Just that, just that one context, let alone marriage and parenting and work and traffic and DMV and the hardware store. And, okay. just, just that one place. Just, just think of that. Are my posts if I'm on there, obeying God in Philippians 2.14? Am I like a light in a grumbling world? Brothers and sisters, we should be holding fast the word of life, and that should affect everything we write, everything we post, everything we say. This is our joy. This is our calling, so that in the day of Christ, we may be able to bring this fruit of a grateful, encouraging heart to the Lord and celebrate that, yes, his gospel does make a difference because they look different who believe in Jesus. They talk differently who believe in Jesus. They post differently. They discuss differently. They disagree differently who believe in Jesus. The word of life has made a difference. Their salvation is evident. And on that day, all of the moments where we did not complain and chose to be grateful, where we did not dispute and chose to pursue peace, all of those moments will be brought to bear as evidence of the power of Jesus Christ and his gospel and to his glory. May we be those on this great field of Christian athleticism who stand out to the glory of our Savior by not grumbling, not disputing, peacefully entrusting ourselves to the Lord in everything we say and do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy in giving us your word. 
Lord, thank you for saving us, Lord. You saved grumbling, discontented people. You saved me, Lord. And even now, I'm a complainer. Lord, I, I sinfully argue often. Lord, I pray that you would transform us into obedient children. Lord, make us grateful. Make us content. Make us encouraging. Lord, give us self-control in what we write and what we say. Lord, even what we think. Lord, give us the grace to honor you in this way. Make us a church filled with the fruit of righteousness to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.